and back up. I want people to know that I am a person with a disorder, but I don't let it stop me. Then for Ben. She's incredibly brave. And I think people, you know, often don't even realize that she's suffering. Sometimes I think she doesn't even realize that she's suffering. There are patients who are suffering from the disease. So there is clearly unmet need. So we need to develop a treatment that can cure the disease. You good? Yep. I feel like I see her dying in front of me. So we are running against time. Understanding. I want to show people that life is still worth living. I love playing the piano. It's such a tactile instrument, so you don't need sight to do it. It's such a good meditation device of mine. I am Ellie White. I am a 21-year-old student. I'm a junior at Metropolitan State University of Denver, studying music therapy. Ooh, I should do this one. I want to do something that's part psychology and part music. I know how important music is to people, and I know it can help them. And to make that a job, it's just like a dream to me. Ellie is just such a blessing in my life. She's smart, she's got such beautiful integrity. But one of the things I admire most about her is how she really lets nothing hold her back. Show us what she can do with that. Oops. <laughs> but the reality is, is that she doesn't have a life like normal people. Hey, what do you say? That's right. What are you today? A bird. I like that. When I was three years old, I was diagnosed with type 1 juvenile diabetes, which is why I have this monitor that I wear. It has this tube and a needle that's connected to my arm that I have to wear 24-7. I have to monitor my blood sugars. I have to continuously give myself shots and injections or finger pokes. We're really always going by the seat of our pants because when you have a medical condition, you just don't know what the day's gonna bring. With her blood glucose, you know, for instance, she might go low, and having low blood glucose is, you know, super dangerous. So we have to stop whatever we're doing and, and take care of that. It doesn't matter what we're doing, or where we're going, or what needs to be done next. And, and that's perfect, because there's an alarm. <laughs> but our blood glucose is a problem right now. So then I have to check on my phone, and it says you're 65, so we need to get you some juice or some chocolate milk or something. What can I get you? Do we have any chocolate milk? Yes, we have a chocolate milk. I'm going to put it in a little cup for you. There's nothing worse as a parent, go love, than to see your child suffer. Sorry, sweetie. And as a three-year-old, I had to poke her finger and, you know, make blood come out in, in order to test her, test her blood glucose. And we did that about every other hour around the clock. I was just so devastated, you know, just really overwhelmed and trying to figure out how are we going to cope. Sadly, it turned out that that was, um, that was really only the beginning. Later in life, when I was about seven, we found not only was my visual acuity poor, but it was not correctable to 2020. While we, I was sitting with the eye doctor trying to figure out what's going on, he gave her the um, a little book that, for color blindness, and um, she and her brother were looking at it, and I could hear her brother was talking about the numbers that he could see, and I could hear Ellie say, there's not numbers there, you know, what do you, what, what do you see? And he turned the page and said, well, that one's at 27. She's like, no, there's nothing there. I overheard that, I was like, oh my goodness. 
she's developed color blindness, which color blindness in, in girls is very rare, but it's also you know even more rare for somebody to not be born with it, for them to develop it. So this was really concerning to me, because we had to do a lot of testing. It took a lot of time before we finally got the answer, a genetic diagnosis. Wolfram syndrome is a disorder that I was diagnosed with 13 years ago. Wolfram syndrome is an autosomal recessive disorder, which means that there are, there are two genes in your body, and if both genes are good, then you don't have it. If you have one mutation in one of the genes and not in the other, then you're a carrier. And if you have two, so one mutation in one gene and one in the other one, then then you have Wolfram syndrome. And it's as simple as two base pairs that are incorrect out of the almost four billion that you have in a body. Essentially, I have one that's incorrect, and that makes me fine, but I'm a carrier. When Ellie was born, she got one mutated gene from me and one from her father. Wolfram syndrome is a rare genetic disorder that causes type 1 diabetes, progressive vision loss, progressive hearing loss, coordination loss, and eventually brain stem and breathing difficulties. Eventually, my body will just forget how to breathe. Research is being done, but there is no cure or treatment. It's a death sentence. And the life expectancy is 30 to 40 years old. And that can be really hard to think about. And of course, this was heartbreaking to my mom. This disorder takes people's lives. I mean, it takes their future. It takes everything from them. It's, I guess, an interesting coincidence that she was diagnosed with a genetic disorder, and then that's similar to the research that I do. I'm a molecular biologist. I work at CU, the Health Sciences Center. I do HIV research, COVID research. So it just, it made it hit really close to home. But it also made me feel more challenged to try to find a cure and to really jump into the research. Wolfram syndrome was so rare that when Ellie was diagnosed with it, there was no research being done on it. And so I reached out to a whole bunch of researchers that I thought might be able to help, might be doing something that was similar, you know, some sort of research that would be helpful. And I found Dr. Rano who was doing work on it. So when I was a very young doctor, I was involved in the care of a 17-year-old boy with a rare form of cancer. And I presented his case in front of all the doctors, you know, attending physicians. And the nurse took him from the ward to the room. We discussed his case. He was very sick already. When he was leaving a room, he smiled at me. And that really struck me. I realized a few months later he passed away. Very unfortunately. He had a rare form of cancer. No chemotherapy walked out he passed away. He was 17. So my kids are 16, so around my son's age. And uh, I realized I had to study mechanisms of the disease to treat these patients. You know, no treatment. Okay, we need to know more about the mechanisms. And while I was working at NYU, I found Wolfram. I found a clue about their mechanisms of Wolfram. I was studying pediatric cancer, but I found Wolfram, which is characterized by juvenile onset diabetes, vision loss, and neurodegeneration. And uh, so it was an accident, pure accident. I became very interested in Wolfram. My name is Fumi Urano, and I am directing the Wolfram syndrome research here. We have been making a steady progress. I thought this could be a chance for me to help these patients suffering from disease without any treatment. 
Dr. Fumihiko Urano has pushed research so quickly, so amazingly. Ellie and I go to Washington University in St. Louis, and there's a Wolfram Clinic that they do every year. So you have a definitive diagnosis of Wolfram syndrome mm -hmm. as determined by genetic testing. I just went to St. Louis. I was there for five days. They do smell tests. They did taste tests. So now put your chin in, okay? They did vision testing. They do hearing testing, MRI. They do every possible exam you can ever think of in three days. Good. Now squeeze my fingers as hard as you can. Good. Okay. Now, not only did I have all of these different tests in a couple days, but my amazing brothers and my amazing mom also went with me and had all of these same tests done to them and used them as a control baseline to help push the research forward. Rare disease research is so hard because it's difficult to secure funds and uh, difficult to find a solution. And if I don't move forward quickly, clearly every year I lose my patients. You know, so few patients die every single year. Every time my patients die, I feel devastated. So we are running against time. The most important thing is to find a cure for Wolfram syndrome. That's like my highest priority in my life right now because there's nothing more important in my life than my kids and to see Ellie suffer like this is just you know I feel like I see her dying in front of me she's got type 1 diabetes she's lost her vision sense of smell and taste are deteriorating and muscle control and as a dancer there's like you know for in her life that's that's always been so important dance is my life i've been doing it ever since i was two years old styles such as ballet point jazz tap hip-hop you name it i do it keeps me active keeps me healthy it also is another emotional just release that if i'm stressed out or if i'm sad or anything's going wrong. I just wanna to go to the dance studio and just dance. And when I was nine years old, my dance group, we were invited to compete on America's Got Talent. We made it far into the show. We ended up actually second place in the entire show. I used it as a big platform to get the word out about Wolfram Syndrome. Wolfram is very rare. The prevalence is one in 500,000. So probably in the United States, there are only 1,000 patients. When I was diagnosed with Wolfram Syndrome, I was the only one in all of Colorado. And there were very few things written about it online. So I know what it's like to be in the dark. We felt so abandoned kind of lonely after her diagnosis. Having the doctors in a room with you and tell you there's no treatment, there's no cure, there's like absolutely nothing. And then to think that nobody's, nobody's doing research on it because it's so rare that nobody cares. Many people are not interested in this. You know, oh, this is such a rare disease. I'm so sorry, you know, you are so unfortunate. There is nothing we can do. But by raising awareness, I think people may feel differently. I started my own foundation when I was first diagnosed with Wolfram Syndrome because I knew that it was such a rare thing. No one knew about it. And I knew there were other individuals with this disorder and with disorders similar to this that might just be too scared to do anything and they might think their life is over. And I want to show people that life is still worth living. We just work tirelessly and constantly doing fundraisers all over the country. You know, Ellie had this idea and said, if we're gonna be successful at this, we're gonna need to have a foundation. We're gonna need to raise awareness. We're gonna need to do it on a larger scale. I have three main goals with my foundation. 
The first one is to spread awareness to families to make sure that they know that they are not alone and that work is being done. My second goal is to raise money all around the country to donate to the researchers at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. But my biggest goal is to just keep pushing research forward. I want to help start as many clinical trials as I can. We are interested in funding the most cutting edge research. So we're real excited. We do have um, a clinical trial and it's based off of a compound that I had come across a few years ago. These are for during the next meal test. So we need two steps to cure Wolfram syndrome. Okay, let's treat diabetes. Let's treat vision loss. And let's treat neurodegeneration. We may be able to uh, solve these problems. We may be able to stop the progression. But that does not actually cure the disease. Ellie has lost much of her vision. So to restore the functions of damaged tissues, we need regenerative medicine. It's a new area of medicine. So we will try to create new eye cells, new insulin producing cells, new brain cells in the dish, transplant, or inject regenerative molecule into eyes to regain eyesight. It may sound like, you know, scientific fiction, but theoretically that's possible. Scientifically, there's reason to believe that if we could find a cure for Wolfram syndrome, it would lead to a cure for these other situations as well. Not only would it help Ellie, but it would help so many people. Just type 1 diabetes affects so many people, and blindness affects so many people, and hearing loss. Of course, there's always that thought in the back of my head that I have th this disorder and I might not live that long. And that can be hard, but I don't let it affect me because I know that there's nothing I can do about it. People like Ellie and Bess keep me going. Their dedication to support other patients, their dedication and the enthusiasm to find a cure for Wolfram syndrome is so inspiring and impressive. I do plan my life like I'm going to live past the life expectancy of my disorder. I want to have kids. I want to be a mom. And there's Ryan's budra. <laughs> Sometimes I try to just close my eyes and imagine, you know, that, that we find a cure. And I, I picture her in a wedding gown or carrying her babies around or, or that sort of thing. But I'm just desperately scared that we're not going to make it and that that's not going to be what happens. Um. This is the disorder that I have. It does not have me. And I'm going to live my life how I can, while I can. She's incredibly brave, and I think people, you know, often don't even realize that she's suffering. Sometimes I think she doesn't even realize that she's suffering because she's so brave about it. Standing back out, pulling back up. She has such a beautiful tendency to just always look for the best in everything, you know, the best in every moment of life and the best in every person. I want to be around her all the time. <laughs> you know, she just has such an incredible spirit and heart, and she's ready and up for everything all the time. <laughs> My diagnosis of Wolfram syndrome is a thing that I would say did close one door, knowing that my life might you know, be shorter than normal people. But in the other way, it opened so many other amazing doors. Like over here, Ellie, to, oh. the, to my right, yep. Thank you. It has helped me live life to the fullest while I still can. We're just like, you only live once. I wanted her to get to see as much of the world as possible and get to experience as much as possible. And I don't want uh, you know, her to be afraid of anything. I 
want people to know that I am a person with a disorder, but I don't let it stop me. So I want to show people that there's no hurdle or obstacle that's big enough to stop you from doing something. Three, two, one. We are at Bible Point in SS Park. We just did a two a mile and a half or two mile hike up the mountain. Hi, how are you doing? Great. Oh, good. I'd say the weather is probably like in the lower 70 degrees. It's seems super sunny, it's nice and breezy, and we didn't let anything get in our way, and we just all pushed through and did it together. We were supporting each other, and it was just, you know, a happy family going up the mountain. We all have a disability, but they're only different abilities. So yes. we did it, we're here, it's awesome, so keep going. <laughs> I don't let my disorder, I don't let disability, I don't let other people tell me I can't. If someone starts saying I can't, that's even more of a reason that I should do it. There's no way that we would ever fully understand what it's like to be someone else. Yeah, yeah so actually if you see okay. here how they're like indents, if you want to do like that, you can do it. Braille dots, and you can see the dots. So it says communication 3100, and then it has over here today's date. I love learning. I love, love, love helping other people. So I want to be able to do that to impact others and to continue doing what I love doing. We are concerned about the experiences of the other. This disorder will just continue to progress and get worse. Communication as experience. But that's where I put my foot down and say, I'm not going down without a fight. And if no one does anything, nothing's going to get done. So we got to start somewhere. Wolfram research is so important to raise the awareness of Wolfram is so important. And to save patients like Ellie is important. Ellie is my friend, not my patient, my friend. I want to get stuff done. I want to live life. I'm going to go do stuff that, you know, normal people my age wouldn't even consider doing. Having Wolfram syndrome, you know, having this kind of a disorder, having a medical condition that affects every moment of your life. Accidentally started down low first. And it doesn't bring her down. Because usually it starts like up high first. Um, I just couldn't be more proud of her or more impressed at what a, an amazing human being she is. I have the world's best mom. She helps me learn independence and she helps me learn that I am an individual that can make a difference. She literally is the biggest rock in my life. Just the laughter we've shared, the amazing experiences, scarier experiences which are still very memorable just having those unique family experiences is incredible and having such amazing relationships with Dr. Urano and all of his team is just amazing I just know that there's so many more unfortunate cases where my life could have ended up but we just need to you know try to find a silver lining, because I know and I strongly believe that there is a silver lining in everything. And if you never find it and never, you know, walk towards it, then you're just always gonna be, you know, dwelling in sorrows. Life's too short to let something get in your way. So have fun, experience life, and freak out your mom at every chance you can. <laughs>
Wolfram Syndrome, I feel like I'm the luckiest girl alive.